I think we got a little bit of a surprise reaction from the Air Force. I think that they thought that they could pit Anchorage and Fairbanks, or the interior and South Central, against one another so that we would be fighting over the assets. They misjudged the strength of the people in this state. They misjudged how Alaskans view our military and what it is that we can provide them. Now, the Air Force is continuing to uh, accept comments on their Ileson plan until the 1st of March. They're not accepting electronic comments, so we have set it up through our website. And you can submit your comments up until March 1. Go to murkowski.senate.gov. Many of you already have done that. I appreciate it. If you have not, if you know others, I would, I would truly uh, hope that you would weigh in. Again, Ileson absolutely benefits our entire state, our entire nation. This is not just an issue that relates to the interior. But we have to do more than just commenting on these proposals that are floating out there. We've also, we're also in competition with other defense communities across the country who are also attempting to make their bases efficient and, and effectively very attractive. You all in this body took a major step by funding construction of the Tananaw River Bridge. We recognize that this is going to open up vast training grounds to the Army. I thank you for that. Keep it up. That's exactly the type of thing that we need to be doing to, to help our military, to help our installations, to help our country. We also need to think creatively. And the governor has suggested a, a single squadron of F-16s in Germany perhaps might be situated better at Eielson. That would help to reduce our footprint overseas, reduce those costs overseas, and it clearly would make Eielson more cost efficient. So I've directed the Air Force to take a look at that, uh, as well as Eielson's appropriateness for any other missions that might be available. Now, we all know that another factor that is, is at play in the military's decision-making is energy and the cost of energy. And the truth is, this is not just limited to the military. This is, this is across our state. It is critical to every Alaskan. And I think, I think we recognize that av as we have seen uh, our costs go up uh, and, and regulatory um, uh, impact in, into certain areas, certain uh, communities, there's, there is a recognition that the interior is, is hurting right now. And um, when we look to those solutions, I think it's important that, again, we come together as a state, that we not view this parochially, but uh, we look at how we're benefiting the entire state. As I go around the state, whether I'm in a tiny village along the Yukon or uh, uh, out on the coast or, or on, on the road system, I'm asking people, well, how much of your budget, how much of your family budget is going towards energy? And in some parts of our state, out in the interior, out in the bush, families are paying up to 47% of their budget to keep warm, to keep the lights on. Compare that with what's going on in the rest of the country. On average, it's somewhere between 4 and 6% of the family's budget that goes towards their energy. We are so far out of the ballpark, it, it, people can't even understand what we are up against. So what do we do about it? I think the fastest progress, quite honestly, can be made here at the state level. That's why I hope that, uh, and I know, that you are, are devoting considerable time to the slate of the energy proposals that are being circu circulated by the governor and by many members in, in this body. I would encourage you to uh, aggressively work to reduce our energy prices in our bush communities along the rail belt, particularly a plan to get natural gas to the interior. I would, I would hope that you would consider our longer term options as well. We can't just be looking at the short term, even the midterm. We've got to push beyond in-state gas line, underground coal gasification, uh, a geothermal from our volcanoes, uh, a, a resource that I think we too often overlook. I know some of you have had an opportunity to, to visit Iceland. Look at what energy independence can truly mean. Our coastal wind farms, uh, expanded use of our, of our vast hydro resources. So the focus on energy is absolutely key and critical 
to, to our overall economy. At the federal level, there's a lot of talk going on right now, a lot of conversation uh, about the energy boom, and we're rightfully celebrating it. The United States has just posted its largest ever increase in annual oil production, some 790,000 barrels per day. That's good news. It's great news. But production here in the state of Alaska fell by about 35,000 barrels. And despite nearly 40 billion barrels of oil waiting to be developed, we all know the story. Taps is emptier than ever. And what I'm pointing out to my colleagues uh, back in Washington and the administration, and quite honestly anybody that is willing to listen, I remind them that we have tremendous opportunity here in Alaska, but we face unbelievable frustration. We need to have an all-of-the-above energy policy in this country, but it has to include all 50 states. So I've been working for about the past year now on a proposal on, on a on a way that we can reframe the conversation about energy, how we can view it in the positive. From a, we've gone from a position of scarcity to one of abundance. The, out of 115 pages, I'll give you the Reader's Digest condensed version, energy is good. It is as simple as that. And for those who are living without, they know exactly what that means. So I've, I've released this blueprint. It's, it's entitled Energy 2020, A Vision for America's Energy Future. And it's, it's intended to provoke a new and I think a more thoughtful discussion about energy and to recognize how bright our future can be if we produce our resources and we prioritize innovation. We've got to be pushing ourselves every day on the R&D side. We've got to be always challenging ourselves to do better than what we have today. Let's move forward with that. Now, as you might expect, it's got all kinds of good ideas. I wrote it. Of course, it has good ideas. Um, but it, 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 it is designed to not only help the country, but to allow Alaska to produce more energy, really, of, of every kind. Um, this legislative session is, is I think, starting off uh, on, on the right foot, at least from the perspective of the Energy Committee. I'm, I'm encouraged by my relationship with the new chairman of the committee, uh, Ron Wyden from Oregon. I invited him up to the state last summer to, to really focus on some of Alaska's issues, to understand what it is that we're dealing with. Uh, one area where we have great agreement is, is with hydropower. We're collaborating on some ideas to promote this resource. We're looking forward to advancing legislation uh, this year. Uh, just last week, the committee held its first hearing was focused on natural gas. Uh, exports clearly were a large part of that conversation. And, and given the boom that we have seen in the lower 48 with, with natural gas production, uh, given our location here, I would suggest, I think we would all agree, that the overseas market are clearly uh, the best opportunity for, for Alaska. Most of Congress, however, as they're talking about, uh, about exports, most of Congress's attention right now is focused on lower 48 exports, but I think the greatest prospect could really be right here in Alaska. I was over in Japan uh, in mid-January, uh, not only in Japan, but also Taiwan, and I was, was there in part to, to help facilitate movement among potential buyers. Alaska's LNG, we recognize, is not going to be ready for delivery in the next several years when, when Japan clearly needs it most, and, and Taiwan also is looking to, to find that, that uh, I immediate source. But I think it's important for us to remember that stability is equally important. And uh, every meeting that I was in with the Japanese, they would bring up the 42 years of, of importing LNG from Nikiski to Japan. They would bring it up in every meeting. Long-term relationships matter, and I think we need to remember that. Also, the open water between Alaska and Asia really matters. There are no choke points out there, there's no pirates, and there's no third-party national waters to traverse. So whether you're Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, there's a great deal of interest. 
Now, export markets may be the key to development of our stranded Arctic resources, and that's one of the reasons why I've been very pleased with your decision to create the Alaska Arctic Policy Commission. We see, as, the, as Canada steps up to, to chair the Arctic Council now, the U.S. steps up in 2015, I'm hoping that your commission is going to move quickly, make its recommendations in time for the State Department to incorporate them into their policy decisions. Another thing that I've been working on, continue to push um, uh, to, to move the State Department to place or nominate, uh, appoint an Arctic ambassador, to have somebody that is the point person that's responsible, that's taking the lead, is going to be important to kind of focus the issues as well. So we are we're continuing with that as we, as we work on further engagement on Arctic issues. 